We'll now call this meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome everyone who's in attendance here in the meeting tonight and also those that will be viewing the meeting on G10 television. Uh, to begin, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance led by uh, Council Member Robert Warden, followed by the invocation by uh, John Carter. Please rise. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, as always, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this beautiful day, for the blessings and benefits that you so graciously bestow upon each of us and upon this, our city of Jacksonville. Tonight we pray for peace, peace in our individual lives, peace in this nation, peace in our world. We pray that each of us will strive for justice and peace and that we will each respect the dignity of every human being. We pray for our military who are serving us here and around the world for their safety and for their anxious families. And as always, we ask your guidance and your direction to be with our mayor and with our council. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Council, you have uh, you've been provided with copies of the agenda for tonight's meeting. I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda and add three consent items. You should have those also at your place. Phelps, I'll make the motion to adopt the agenda with the addition of the three consent items. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, we have a couple of presentations to make tonight. Uh, first, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Heather Keeper from the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, she's a planner uh, with the Eastern Branch. Um, North Carolina uh, Department of Public Safety. If you'd come forward. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight to present an award of achievement to the city for the North Carolina, um, for the Class 7 CRS achievement um, that you have. The CRS is the Community Rating System, and it is um, a program that FEMA regulates uh, to provide to provide uh, insurance assistance or um, relief to the area. Um, unfortunately, they're not here this evening, and they would like me to read something on their behalf. Um, good evening. Though we're not able to attend the meeting tonight, but Floodplain Management Insurance Branch of FEMA Region 4 is honored that the City of Jacksonville has achieved a Community Rating System CRS Class 7 rating. The city of Jacksonville, North Carolina, began participating in the emergency or entry phase of the National Insurance Program on February 24, 1975. The city of Jacksonville received its first flood insurance study and flood insurance rate maps on February 15, 1985, and was converted to the full regulation phase of the NFIP, making a full amount of flood insurance available through the National Flood Insurance Program and available to its citizens and property owners. Since entering the NFIP, we have seen the city of Jacksonville make increased strides in the administration and enforcement of its floodplain management program. The result of this, these increased efforts and safer, more disaster resistant and resilient community. In the early 1990s, FEMA began to recognize communities for exceptional efforts in floodplain management by reducing flood insurance premiums through the community rating system or CRS. Pro, uh, programs. A number of the floodplain management related activities were identified and credited based on a point system that was developed for these activities. Communities receive 5% discount for each class as they advance from a class 9, 5% discount to a class 1, which is 45% discount. These discounts preside, pro, provide incentive for flood protection, preparedness, and mitigation activities that can help save the lives and protect property in the event of a flood. Policyholders in the city of Jacksonville first began receiving discounts on October 1st, 1991. 
when the city of Jacksonville became a CRS class nine. Today, there are 579 flood insurance policies in force in the city. That represents more than $150 million in flood insurance coverage. Policyholders in the special flood hazard area can now receive 15% discount on their flood insurance policy premiums, which is an average saving of $163 per policy. Some in lower areas and that are lower risk are eligible for a 5% discount on policy savings of approximately $92 per year. In a total, policyholders realize an annual savings of $11,000. Because the city of Jacksonville participates in the CRS, while NFIP policyholders receive flood insurance premium discounts, all citizens, residents, and property owners in the city benefit from safer built environment and enjoy the area when it's less vulnerable from flooding and damage. And this will be more resilient to damage in future flooding events. We want to recognize the City of Jacksonville CRS team and the many departments that play a key role in floodplain management. For their contributions and dedication to the program, it's our honor and recognition of the City of Jacksonville obtaining a Class 7 in the Community Rating System. Congratulations. be recognized for doing something good. Uh, the next item tonight, we have uh, also, we have some, uh, this uh, presentation here for neighborhood recognition. And I'd like to ask Lily Gray and uh, Carmela George if you would join me up front here. And help me out. With strong guidance from a previous Joint City Council and City Advisory S Committee summit to make addressing our city's older neighborhoods a priority, the new Office of Livable Neighborhoods has been initiated to take a more proactive approach to neighborhood revitalization. We know that strong neighborhoods are the building blocks of strong communities. To that end, our pilot program, the Livable Jacksonville Initiative, has been designed to create and strengthen an opportunity for residents to foster a sense of community in the areas where they live, to assist residents in communicating more effectively to city officials the needs of their neighborhoods, and to encourage residents to work together to keep their neighborhoods attractive and safe places to live. Uh, livable neighborhood staff has worked diligently over the last several months to engage and energize residents in two of the city's oldest neighborhoods, Belfort Homes, and Bayshore Estates. This evening, we are formally acknowledging a partnership with these two neighborhood groups by presenting organization leaders with their very first certificates of recognition. <clears throat> I'd like to ask now if Mr. Linwood Cobb and the Belfort Homes Neighborhood Association officers, if you would join me up front, please. The Belfort Homes Neighborhood Association was established in 1979 for the purpose of promoting positive community relationships and maintaining the overall beautification and appearance of the Belfort Homes community. Neighborhood leaders have worked with the Office of Livable Neighborhoods staff over the last several months to re-energize participation in the association and begin to address several common resident concerns such as drainage and visibility. The organization has successfully submitted an application for formal recognition by the Office of Livable Neighborhoods. 
We are very appreciative of the association's continuing efforts to preserve and improve their neighborhood. And we want to thank you very much for coming tonight and all that your efforts that you're putting forward. And I think Carmela has a presentation here. This is it. We're going to keep you up here for the photos. How's that? <clears throat> Next, I would like to ask Mr. Joe Kirshner and the Bayshore Estates Neighborhood Organization Officers if you would join me up front, please. The Bayshore Estates Neighborhood Organization was established by a committed group of neighborhood leaders in the late in late 2015. Their mission, keeping the Bayshore Estates neighborhood clean, safe, and attractive, and undertaking activities which improve the quality of life in their neighborhood. Their neighborhood. In the short time it has been established, the group has, been, has seen remarkable participation and has successfully submitted an application for formal recognition by the Office of Louisville Neighborhoods. We applaud their enthusiasm for working together to improve their neighborhoods. And I'd like to present... Oh, yeah, and I didn't read theirs, did I? It's the City of Jacksonville hereby recognizes Bayshore Estates Neighborhood Organization as a partner of the Office of Liberal Neighborhoods and for their dedication to improving the quality of life in their local community. And yours says the same thing about uh, Belfort Homes Organization. Thank you very much for you. coming out tonight. Get plenty of good pictures. Okay. Scoot in. Get this microphone. I know several of you came for the presentations tonight, so I'm just going to take a moment uh, and pause. And if you wish to leave at this time, please feel free to do so. Uh, if you want to stay, that's fine too. And I have on my list here uh, several people that have signed up for the first public comment period. And as I call your name, if you would, which, which podium do you want them to come to? The, if you'll come to the one here on the uh, left, uh, I'd appreciate it. And when you come up, if you would please uh, state your name and address for the clerk. All right. So I would ask uh, Susan Lynch. Uh, I am the finance officer for Eastern Carolina Human Services Agency. I'm speaking on behalf of our executive director, Daphne Hill, who sends apologies because she intended to speak this evening, but she was prevented due to unforeseen circumstances. Our agency is a 501c3 community action agency serving the Jacksonville Onslow area, as well as providing certain services in Duplin, Pender, and New Hanover counties. Many of you may be aware of the decision by Onslow County 
asking us to vacate our premises on Georgetown Road by June 30th or begin paying rent of $5,000 a month. At this time, we are still seeking temporary space to relocate our staff and accommodate our clients. My purpose in addressing you this evening is to ask you to help spread the word throughout the city and the, and the surrounding community that we are an organization in transition, but we are determined that there will be no lapse in the services that we provide. The mission of ECHSA Incorporated is to improve the lives of low-income families in Onslow, Duplin, and New Hanover counties by empowering them to become economically and socially self-sufficient. Allow me to give you a brief overview of our programs. We have the Supportive Services for Veteran Family Program, which uh, is all about housing homeless veterans and providing prevention, preventive services to veterans at risk of becoming homeless. Last year, we assisted 225 area veteran families. We also have the Section 8 Housing Program, and we serve as the area HUD Housing Authority as we administer over 600 regular vouchers, VOSH vouchers for veterans, the Family Self-Sufficiency self Program, offering comprehensive case management and the opportunity of homeownership, and portability vouchers for persons moving into or out of the area. Another program is the Community Services Block Grant, which is a family self-sufficiency program with the goal of having its 200 plus participants per year reach economic independence with decreased reliance on social services or income maintenance programs over a length of time. And finally, we offer a five-star daycare, which offers quality childcare to families in a safe and healthy learning environment. Last year, our agency administered $5.8 million in grant funds with 93% of those funds going to client services. With the assistance of the community, we hope to continue to assist low-income individuals and families in acquiring useful skills and knowledge in order to gain access to new opportunities and achieve economic self-sufficiency. Please help in any way that you can. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lynch. I have uh, uh, some people that have signed up to speak at public comment. I know some of you uh, uh, may have gotten confused in what session, section you want to speak in or, or at what point. Um, is there anyone who wants to speak at, this, at the first public comment section? I know everybody that's on here is for the holiday. Mr. Mayor, the next one is after your non- consent items, so it would be after that. So if they really want to speak according to the schedule, then it should speak now, unless you open up the regular item for to hear folks comment. Just point that out. <coughs> Good evening. I'm gonna call them up. Sue, uh, Paula Jones. I think I might be one of the people that signed and I'm here for the holiday. Let me make sure you understand the, the, the procedure. The agenda is set up where items are specifically concluded before you new, move to the next item. Item 11, which many of you came for tonight, has to do with a resolution establishing a holiday for the 13th Amendment. The next public comment session is actually after the council will make a decision on that. So council really has a couple of choices. One, they can decide that they will open item 11 for public comment before making a decision, thereby allowing people to speak on that issue. But that's a council decision. So I suppose procedurally what you should do, Mayor, is ask council if you're going to instead of having public comment, which would be after you have voted on item 11, 
do you want to have public comment after the presentations on item 11, but as part of the discussion before you vote on item 11? Well, there's no public comment or no public comment called for or public hearing called for in this agenda item. Yeah, you would have to make that decision. The and if council the council decision. would have to make that decision. If, on the other hand, what you want to do is to allow everybody who has signed up for both sessions of public comment to make those public comments now, that would be a way to receive public input. And prior. to be quite frank with you, that's what I'd recommend to you. That's is prior that to the you, issue. That would be prior to the issue. I'd say let it proceed. My, my take would be to proceed with our public comment right now. Those who wish to speak can speak on anything, including item number 11 that's coming up later on. So. All right. Does anybody present wishes to speak on this matter at this time? Just to be on the uh, including agenda item number 11. I suggest you do then is start calling the folks who have actually signed up for public comment. So, Ms. Jones. Okay. So, I am. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me explain. Maybe I'll explain a little better. My name is Paula Jones. Oh. I'm sorry. We're running you around all over the place, aren't we? No. My name is Paula Jones, and I am. I live at 303 Spargo Street, and I am part of a chorus of people who will be speaking later. I was told by the councilwoman that if I needed to, if we were going to speak, we had to sign up. That's why I signed up myself and I think probably some other people as well. And Paula, what you need to do, I apologize for interrupting you. That's now is the time though for you and anyone else who wants to speak on the holiday to speak now. I think there is an order. Am I correct? She's part of a presentation. Mm -hmm. She did not mean to speak in public. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Thank you. It's Anthony Davis. Speaking, but since I am, I just want to say uh, I reside at 421 Bordeaux Street. Uh, I am a retired firefighter with the city of Jacksonville, and my hope is that the council would adopt the emancipation proclamation for the uh, employees. And that's what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. For the second uh, set here, uh, Cindy Edwards. State your name for the record. Nah. <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> Not this time. Okay. Thank you. Um, Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak um, for you just a moment. Uh, having not heard yet the discussion that's forthcoming, my words will be brief. Um, in a community um, as rich and diverse as ours, with the heritage that we have, um, facing a world that's full of some of the challenges that we're well aware of, when we have over 800,000 people still in slavery at this time, um, in various forms of forced labor, um, forced into acts of war and forced into the sex trade. This is something that has gotten global attention and national attention in the past couple of years um, through efforts of you know, the International Justice Mission and uh, the A21 campaign and other organizations that are working around the globe to try to rescue folks who are in these situations and give them a safe place to heal and recover. Um, I think this is something that's definitely worth our attention. It merits the attention of humans who have the capacity to do something for others who don't. Um, our humanity demands that we dignify this problem with a response, in my opinion. Um, I realize that there'll be commentary later, which I look forward to hearing about how the city might um, move forward with this or not move forward with it and deal with some 
logistical challenges that I know it will face in terms of uh, cost and payroll and um, dealing with some of the internal things, which I don't have the authority to comment on, but I realize that when you institute a holiday, it affects your costs and your operations. So I know that there's some challenges there. But if there's a way to implement this that doesn't cause the city harm, but puts the city in a position to celebrate um, human respect, human dignity, and do something to bring attention to some of the problems and atrocities that still exist in our world, then it's a good opportunity for us to do so. I would encourage you to consider it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Burgess. Albert Burgess. Albert Burgess. Yes, sir. He's part of the presentation. Part of the presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, Brian Jackson. He's part of the part presentation. Of presentation. Okay. So anybody else, ha has anybody else come in that didn't get a chance to sign the sheet that wishes to speak at this time? So we'll go on now to the adoption of uh, the minutes and the consent items. We have one meeting. It's a June 7th, 2016 regular workshop meeting. There's uh, 10 uh, consent items. Who adoption of the minutes and the consent items has amended. Second. Any discussion? Here, not all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Brings us to agenda item number eight. This is a uh, voluntary annexation petition. This is for, uh, on behalf of uh, David Ray Hemby and Jeanette, Jeanette Hemby, uh, Staley and Fuller uh, Properties. Uh, this is a voluntary annexation uh, petition for 0.49 acres. Mr. Ron Massey, be. They're on the consent agenda. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Ron Massey, our deputy city manager, will be presenting this item. Mayor and Council, uh, on behalf of David Ray Hemby, and Jeanette Hemby, uh, Bailey and Fuller Properties uh, submitted a petition for a voluntary annexation of a 0.49 acre tract parcel that is contiguous to the current city limit boundaries. The tract is located at 2739 Rich and Richlands Highway near the intersection of Hickory Road and Richlands Highway. The parcel is proposed to uh, join the adjacent tract which is already part of the corporate limits to provide space for a parking lot for the development of an 18,850 square foot Aldi grocery store. This property will generate uh, additional property tax of about $419 uh, annually and a monthly stormwater fee of $5 per equivalent residential unit. Staff recommends the council adopt the annexation or ordinance as presented. Thank you, Mr. Massey. Any questions of Mr. Massey? All right, we have a required public hearing on this matter, so at this time I'll recess the regular council meeting and open the public hearing. Is there anyone present that wishes to speak to this matter? So please uh, raise your hand, Mr. Mr. Bailey. Good evening. I'm Warren Bailey, Bailey & Associates. Uh, tonight, if you will be so kind as to annex this piece of property, <clears throat> I heard what he said the taxes would be, but this will give us an opportunity to expand Freedom Village Shopping Center. <clears throat> and with this, we will have annexed some 80 acres plus or minus into the city limits of Jacksonville. This piece of property will give us an opportunity to build another 18 to 20,000 square feet, which will bring us somewhat over 500,000 square feet that we've added to Southwest Jacksonville and Southwest Onslow County. I don't know how many employees we've got, but of course you can well imagine with Walmart and the others, there are several thousand employees that we have created jobs for. We have city sewer and of course city water which is now all the way at the area of Highway 53 and 258. That being said, we feel like that our shopping center is now a crucial part and a real 
tax base for the county, for the city. And we could not have done it without city services, without being annexed into the city, and without the cooperation of what we've had from not only the council, but the city manager, city attorney, all the staff people. They're tough, they're tough, but they do listen. And if, you, if you've got a good plan, you'll get it through. And I've said so many times up here before, I've worked in a lot of towns, and I hear everybody say, all of a sudden, this town's tough, 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 tough. Jacksonville is tough, but they are in favor of commercial development. And I can tell you this from the commercial community, Jacksonville, Onslow County is as good as any place east of I-95. I can tell you that there's a lot going on in Jacksonville. And so that being said, I appreciate you if you would annex it, and uh, I do believe it would be an asset to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Mr. Mayor, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, allow Mr. Bailey to leave without the staff's personal thank you for helping us build the tax base. Uh, the effort and investment that you have made on that part of town has assisted every residence and every property owner by building the tax base of this city. You build quality, you have brought quality, you have helped us redevelop that side of town, and I want to personally thank you for what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to the, uh, of this matter? All right. I'm going to close the public hearing. Uh, Councilor, you've been asked to uh, approve the uh, annexation ordinance. Uh, Mayor Phelps, I'll make the motion to approve the ordinance. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> all right. Agenda item number nine. We have an appointment. Uh, have an appointment to the also uh, Civic Affairs uh, this time, there's five seats on the uh, Civic Affairs Committee are open for appointment due to term ex expiration. And six seats is open as a result of a uh, vacancy. Uh, Are you going to do so? What is it? Glenn going to do it? I'm sorry. Glenn's going to present this item. You have done well, sir. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, with that said, uh, so with that said, I'm going to... Uh, Mr. Pittner is the uh, liaison, council liaison to the... Uh, uh, Civic Affairs uh, Committee, I would turn to you for any nominations that you might have. My recommendation is to reappoint Donald Carter to seat 9, Oliver Hill to seat 10, and Will Artis to seat 11 for a term to expire September 30th, 2018, and Marsha Wright to seat 12, Carol Hurst Long to seat 13, and Cindy Edwards to seat 14, as reappointments for terms to end September 30th, 2017. Actually, okay. Okay, gotcha. Is that in the form of a motion, yes. Mr. Mayor? Mayor Phillips, I move that the nominations be closed and that the candidates be accepted by acclamation. Okay. We have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Glenn. Nice presentation, Glenn. Appreciate your input. <coughs> you want to do on Wassa? <coughs> we got some appointments to the on Wassa board. It's that time, uh, folks, where we do a reappointment. There we have two positions uh, reserved on the board from the city. And... Uh, the, uh, Mr. Uh, Bittner and Mr. Lazar. Uh, Mr. Bittner is serving an existing three-year um, on Wasa term expiring July 31st, 2016. And Mayor Pro Tem Lazar is uh, serving an existing three-year on Wasa term expiring July 31st, 2018. Based on our ordinance, we reappoint this every year. So uh, with that, I would uh, open the floor for nominations. Move for the reappointment of Mr. Bittner and Mayor Pro Tem Lazar. Second. 
discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, that brings us to, this brings us to agenda item number 11. And this is a resolution establishing a holiday for the 13th Amendment in the city of Jacksonville. And council member um, Jerome Willingham and Mike Canero, public safety director, will be presenting this item. A holiday for you. I'm not going to discuss the 13th Amendment in terms of black versus white because we all know that the struggle for freedom crossed racial lines and religious lines. There were whites who fought for freedom and civil rights and blacks who fought against it. So a discussion in that context would yield inaccuracies. However, I can precisely discuss slavery and every atrocity depicting man's inhumanity to man in terms of the inability or unwillingness to engage in empathy, resulting in us versus them scenarios. So tonight we search for empathy. We're not interested in guilt. We are seeking mutual respect and understanding on an issue which will benefit us all. 13th Amendment. Neither slavery, slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. What is also interesting is uh, Section 2. The constitutional amendments have enabling provisions. And what that does is it, allow, it allows Congress to take further action and for that action to be constitutional. When you look up the 13th Amendment, your search may produce human trafficking right under it. And what we're talking about tonight is something that addressed slavery and the African-American race, but it also benefits society. It benefits us all. And so we'll talk a little more about the benefits that all of society gets from the 13th Amendment. Especially in light of the 150th anniversary of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution in 2015, the following resolution is proposed, was proposed. Resolution of a national holiday for the 13th Amendment. Whereas the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution abolished slavery and involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime. Whereas in the United States of America, the 13th Amendment was passed by the Senate on April 8, 1864, and by the House on January 31, 1865. Whereas the 13th Amendment was ratified by a, num a required number of states on December 6, 1865. Whereas on December 18, 1865, Secretary of State William H. Seward proclaimed the adoption of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Whereas President Abraham Lincoln's resolution to adopt the 13th Amendment is celebrated as an observance on 1 February, but is not a holiday. Whereas liberated countries customarily celebrate their independence with a national holiday. Whereas human freedom is an inalienable right, superior to any other, including political independence. Whereas human bondage and trafficking continues to be an epidemic problem worldwide. Whereas the United States of America has deployed its armed forces to protect and establish freedoms around the world. Whereas it behooves every respectable society to celebrate human freedom and to commit to ensuring human freedom everywhere, regardless of race, color, national origin, sex, religion, genetic information or identity, disability, age, whistleblowing activity, marital status, or political affiliation. It is therefore resolved that the adoption and enactment 
of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution should be celebrated as a holiday in Jacksonville, North Carolina, United States of America, to be celebrated on the second Monday of December, which will always fall between the date the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified by the states, which was on December 6, 1865, and the date the proclamation of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, December 18, 1865. We're often asked, why now? And why didn't we ask for something like this uh, earlier? I'd just like to let you know that, um, not uh, us personally, but this man, Reverend Richard R. Wright Sr., uh, started this 68 years ago. And we have just picked up the issue, and we participate. We're members of the National Black Caucus of Local Elected Officials, and we presented this resolution to that body, and they're part of the National League of Cities, of which we all are members, and they adopted the resolution. It'll be going forward at... Um, our conference this year. So this isn't our creation. This is something that Richard Wright saw. It. And let's see who Richard Wright is. He was a former slave, banker, bishop. He was a major in the army. Back in uh, this day, he fought in the Spanish-American War. He reached the rank of uh, paymaster in the Army. He founded Savannah State University. And he put forth this effort to uh, adopt the National Freedom Holiday in the 30s. What did his effort accomplish? After he died, a year after his death, Congress did adopt a day of uh, observance. And that has been one October, uh, I mean, one February of each year. So that's an observance. We'd like to move forward with this. There's no holiday in the United States for the 13th uh, Amendment. We um, do have holidays for the Emancipation Proclamation. There's a holiday in Texas. The whole state of Texas has a, a, a holiday for freedom, but it's based on the local history and when Texas uh, slaves were free. Puerto Rico has a, a holiday. The U.S. Virgin Al Islands also have a hol holiday. One thing about the Man Emancipation Proclamation, and one reason why we, uh, Richard Wright felt that it was important that we have a holiday to honor the 13th Amendment is because emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation did not make slavery illegal. Um, it freed the slaves in limited territories in a state of rebellion. It was the 13th Amendment um, that was initiated by President Lincoln that actually made sla slavery Ill illegal. And you go back to my introductory slide, uh, and the laws that were enabled, that Congress was a enabled to pass, all flow from the, the 13th Amendment and impact us today. We proudly broadcast our freedom along with Camp Lejeune Marine Corps Base, New River Air Station. We take pride in reminding the world that freedom isn't free. We have beautiful monuments in the fight for freedom. Not so beautiful individual there, but this is a um, beautiful monument. This is um, the museum at the entrance of the Museum of the Marine. I would encourage everybody um, to visit our Lejeune Memorial Gardens. They are first class um, monuments and they celebrate our freedom. Uh, Marines know that this is the Eagle Globe and Anchor the Globe represents 
the readiness of our Marines to fight all over the world. The eagle represents the United States, and the anchor is a tribute to our Navy, uh, of which we're a part. When I got my license tag most recently, it said, First in Freedom. And I admit, I really didn't know what that meant in that context. I saw the date, 1776, and I knew that African slaves were not free at that time. So I did a little research and I discovered that there was a Mecklenburg resolution, a conference that was um, called in this state to address political independence. And it was followed up, interestingly, the paper, the, the, the document that was drafted got burned and there is a dispute over what it actually said. But we do know that North Carolina was the first state uh, to vote that their delegates would vote for independence at the Constitutional um, Conference. And so that's what that means when you see first in freedom. But um, let's be first in freedom tonight. There is no other um, uh, law um, holiday for the 13th Amendment. And um, we understand that this motto, and now we all understand the source of it. But North Carolina put that there for their sense of pride. We can further that pride with the things that we do here tonight. African Americans fought in the Revolutionary War and couldn't enjoy the liberation for which they fought. Peter Salem, Crispus Attucks, Prince Hall, to name a few. They died in World Wars I and II, and survivors returned to this country as second-class citizens. Recently, we contributed to a monument which celebrated the achievement and marked the injustice of the treatment of the Muffet Point Marines. How do we tell them that their ancestors' history of freedom is not as important? In recognition of the Muffet Point Mariners, Every Marine, from private to general, will know the history of those men who crossed the threshold to fight not only the enemy they were to soon know overseas, but to know the enemy of racism and segregation in their own country. The Marine Corps is better today because of a legacy of service to our African American Marines, General Amos F. A, excuse me, General James F. Amos, the 35th Commandant, United States Marine Corps. In addition, in receiving his star in 2004, then Lieutenant General Amos assumed command of the 45,000 plus Marines and sailors of the 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. In 2012, General Amos partnered with key legislators in the House and the Senate to bring national recognition to the service and sacrifices of the Corps' World War II African-American Mumford Point Marines with the awarding of the Congressional Gold Medal. African-American men were recruited into the Marine Corps by presidential order beginning 1942. Establishing a segregated boot camp on a swampy point of land in Jacksonville, North Carolina, known as Moffat Point, the Marines trained some 20,000 African-American men between 1942 and 1949. Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Alexander Vandergift, closed down the segregated training in 1948, stating, the experiment with the Negro Marine is over. They are Marines, period. The Mumford Point Marines served in the Pacific during World War II and again in 1951 during the Korean War. Their service and faithfulness to our nation has never been successfully recognized at the national level until General Amos initiated service level efforts to have them awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. President Barack Obama signed into law the legislation 
to award the Congressional Gold Medal to the Mumford Point Marines on 23 November 2011. This award recognized the Mumford Point Marines for their dedication and service to the United States Marine Corps and the United States of America. Mumford Point Marines, the trials and tribulations they endured in World War II marked only the first milestones of their long journey. Upon returning home to the United States, Mumford Port Marines faced the continuance of segregation, intolerance, and marginalization. Still, these men maintained their course on the road to racial equality. Many of these Marines returned to their hometowns with rucksack filled of bittersweet memory and experience. On 23 June 1949, Secretary of the Navy Francis P. Matthews issued All Nav 494.47, a landmark declaration of racial policy, which decreed equality of treatment and opportunity for all persons in the Navy and Marine Corps without regarding to race, color, religion, or national origin. Let what we do tonight never again allow a Marine to turn, return to Jacksonville from defending us with second set class citizenship or a disrespected heritage. We've seen unity on things like this before. Uh, the history of uh, the 13th Amendment is that the Republicans of Lincoln got together and passed the amendment. The Democrats of Kennedy came together to get civil rights legisl legislation passed, along with, um, and, and we've become a caring, caring community. I remember the contributions from all segments of our society when we were uh, competing for all America's status, and we came together um, from all segments. North Carolina ratified the amendment over 150 years ago. When asked how the slaves felt about Independence Day, 4th of July, Frederick Douglass stated, they probably liked the fireworks. African Americans remained in a state of human bondage for about 100 years after American independence from Britain. And even Britain freed the slaves 31 years before America did. We embrace all of the holidays and traditions of, of this great country. And when we talk about uh, the, the Independence Day, what we're trying to do is say, how would you feel? That's, that's just the question. And, and the closest thing that we have to raise that question to is um, the freedom of America from Great Britain and how that, um, that holiday is recognized. We fully support all of the holidays and the 4th of July. Anybody coming to this country needs to embrace our traditions and the heritages of this country, even if they are newly formed citizens. And so African Americans have been here and fought and died and embrace all of that. We're not saying that it shouldn't be a 4th of July. We're just saying, how would you feel? And this is the crux of the argument. As descendants of slaves, the only way the benefits of the Declaration of Independence or the protections of the Bill of Rights redound to us is through the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution. When that um, the Bill of Rights were adopted, they did not apply to African Americans. No First Amendment, no Second Amendment, and so forth. The, as it goes through, through the first 10 amendments to the US Constitution. So this is everything to us, the 13th Amendment. It allows us to even sit here along with the other Reconstruction Amendments. 
we cannot be a caring community without empathy. And we talked about empathy uh, before. Um, the lack of empathy allows us to find colonialism unacceptable when we are subjects, yet comfortable when others are subjects. The absence of empathy leads to our assuming this us versus them posture, which annihilates the possible existence of empathy. Empathy allows us to feel or understand what someone else is experiencing from their reference, from their position. If you are empathetic, you can do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. When you see examples of man's inhumanity to man, empathy is necessarily missing. In the over 15 years I've been on city council, I can categorically say that when council has been polarized unto us versus them, we have been at our worst. And I think the mayor will agree with that. Luke 631 tells us that as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. We've always been taught the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Matthew 7, 12 tells us, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We've heard the questions of, um, is it reasonable to absorb the financial impact of, of this? Is it reasonable to absorb the service impact of this? And um, I'm going to park those questions because um, those questions don't get at the essence of what we're talking about. Um, those questions are applicable to any holiday, any of them. But what we're talking about is how would you feel? You can use it the 4th of July. Um, we know how you fe would feel because you have adopted it and you have a holiday. And so um, this is our 4th of July. So we know how you feel. One of the comments that I heard um, from uh, friends, when will we get over this? One way I would suggest is by showing empathy and doing the right thing. Having said that, I still don't think that's the proper question. We celebrate the 4th of July. We don't celebrate colonialism, right? We celebrate independence. When we celebrate the 13th Amendment, we're celebrating freedom. We're not celebrating slavery. We're celebrating freedom. You have 4th of July every year. We don't say, when will you get over there? That was 1776, because we understand what it's all about. It's about that freedom that was defined in the um, Declaration of Independence as the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Doesn't that define freedom? It does. And this is what I hope we can take away from this. I, my job is resolving employment discrimination issues and workplace disputes. What I do is based off the 14th Amendment to the Constitution and the Civil Rights Acts from 1964 as amended. My point is that to get those laws, to get that legislation, there was a huge sacrifice. It was a sacrifice that crossed racial lines and crossed religious lines. But it was a, a lot of what you see in terms of the suffering was visited upon African Americans when they were attacked by dogs, uh, beaten. And the laws were to address that situation. But as with the Civil Rights Laws, as with the 13th Amendment, look at the benefits. 
this stream may be that struggle, but when the fireworks burst, look at the benefits. If you look at the laws that I deal with, and we have 13 protected categories, and from these that we call them bases, you can file discrimination complaints. Not one of them says African American. It says race. So you are protected, you are protected, everybody is protected as a result of that struggle. And it's the same thing with the 13th Amendment. And I'll show you how. We'll, do, we'll show you a little later. But what we're trying to do here is honor um, this uh, freedom. And we're talking about um, human bondage, human trafficking <clears throat> that continues worldwide. It's an epidemic. We're honoring the people that suffered that, past and present. Who could be against it? It honors the legislators from Congress to the states that ratified it, including North Carolina, the combatants, and again, those who suffered. This was a huge deal, the Civil War. Over 750,000 ca uh, casualties. And that, the, the amount of those casualties was um, higher than the totals of all the other wars put together in the history of this country up until at some point in the Vietnam War. For a country to be able to heal, overcome that, come together as we have come together, that's an amazing feat. Look around, see what kind of countries could, could go through a civil war and heal the way that this country did. But what really uh, I like and attracts my attention about the Constitution is those words to form a more perfect union. And what that means to me is that regardless of how difficult things are, we're moving in a direction of being better, of being uh, more perfect. Imagine a loved one, because this could happen to you all, could happen to your children, your daughters and granddaughters, uh, being kidnapped and, and relegated to human slavery. I saw some video uh, on TV last week about somebody in a convenience store uh, attacking a young girl and trying to separate her from her mom. This stuff happens today. And so it includes forced labor uh, by children participating in war and sex. And this is an issue worth our focus, and we can do that focus by honoring the 13th Amendment. Jacksonville did Police Department undercovered an operation that led to human trafficking charges. An undercover operation at the Motel 6 on North Marine Boulevard resulted in charges of human trafficking, officials said, and there may be more arrests coming. Ms. Miller and Mr. Maddox are accused of recruiting a 15-year-old girl for the purposes of prostitution between Wednesday and Thursday of this week, according to their warrants. The Jacksonville Police Department arrested the pair on Thursday and charged both Miller and Maddox with one count each of felony human trafficking of child victim and felony statutory rape of a child at least 15 years of age, according to the warrants. And this was posted 3 June 2016 in the Jacksonville Daily Newspaper. Human trafficking in North Carolina, slavery in plain sight. From the student paper of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the Daily Hill, excuse me, the Daily Tar Hill, excuse me. <laughs> slavery, a word many people associate with the dark past of history or something that exists in other countries, but not here. But that part of the American history has not ended. And human trafficking, commonly known as modern slavery, isn't only a problem affecting somewhere, someone else in some part of another world. Labor trafficking includes forced work, like agri agricultural work and housekeeping, while sex trafficking specifically refers to forced sex work, such as forced prostitution or forced sexual relationships. Sex trafficking also includes anyone younger than 18 years of age who participate in sex work because minors cannot legally consent. 
According to the International Labor Organization, 1.5 million people are trafficked for labor annually in developed economies, and more than 20 million people are trafficked for labor worldwide, of which 4.5 million are forced into sexual exploitation. The United Nations estimate that human trafficking is a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States, third only to illegal drugs transactions and trading illegal firearms. Large highway systems in North Carolina provide easy access to transporting individuals for trafficking purposes. Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte, Greensboro, and Wilmington are trafficking hubs because of the popular highway system through those cities. This breaks the myth that people who are trafficked aren't American, says Amy Weil, a medical co-director of Beacon Child and Family Program, which provides services for people who have experienced interpersonal violence. Because we live in the I-95 corridor, our problems are usually trafficking across state borders with people who have been born in this country, Weil said. This gives you some idea of children who are forced into combat. And there are a lot of different estimates. This one says around 250,000 worldwide. This is the face of modern slavery. When freedom is challenged, troops from our community are often the first to respond. We have dedicated our human resources. We have enshrined the contribution. This holiday further honors the rich history of Jacksonville, North Carolina. This is a continuing of our caring commitment. Seize the moment, Capri Diem. If you look at this issue as something we shouldn't have to deal with, it may be easy to do nothing but life brought us here. The question has been called and how we answer will define who we are as leaders and the consciousness of Jacksonville. Either we are that inclusive caring community or we are indifferent as it relates to respect of freedoms. Either the freedoms of all Americans is important or we are about valuing the freedom of this group of Americans and being careless about the freedoms of that group of Americans. First, they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out. Then they came for the communists, and I did not speak out. Please come up. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out. Then they came for me. They came for me, and there was no one to speak out. But before they came for the Jews, they came for the Africans. And thank God, after 400 years, enough Americans spoke for them, fought with them. Those Americans came together and passed the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, not asking for whom the bill told. <clears throat> No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as a promontory were, as well as a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. We as citizens of the country of countries, these United States of America, should right our historical wrongs by taking stronger stands for human rights and therefore truly becoming the world leader that we commonly claim that we are. We are more powerful than we know and love is the sharpest tool that we possess. Instead of moving backwards towards annihilation and destruction, let us move forward towards progress and preservation. Let us not become less civilized at a more technologically advanced rate. When we say that we are waiting for them or they to
to do something. We make ourselves powerless instead of assuming the power to be the change. For we are they, the they that we have been waiting for. Sign B. Henry, me, a representative of we, the POTUS, we, the people of the United States, city of Jacksonville. Without empathy, a God complex is assumed where you dictate how I feel about my pain, my suffering. With empathy, we understand that your suffering is mankind's suffering, is my suffering. Ergo, we speak on behalf of each other and no longer sin for whom the bell tolls. We invite you to stand as a united, caring community in Jacksonville. I'd like to invite our police chief up to speak on human trafficking. Mayor, council, thank you for this opportunity to talk about human trafficking. I think uh, the first thing that we, when we talk about human trafficking, it's really three things. It's force, it's, um, and it's using, um, it's, it's, it, it's exploiting people. So when we talk about human trafficking in North Carolina, <clears throat> one of the things that we really need to talk about is we need to understand what it is. And basically, human trafficking <coughs> creates a dependency using, is, is very similar to domestic violence. Victims are develop that same kind of mentality that people that experience domestic violence have. So force, coercion, exploitation, all those things are used for a number of different reasons, whether it's forced labor, whether it's prostitution, whether it's, uh, whether it's just domestic issues. <clears throat> Under federal and state law, we can prosecute, and we have prosecuted people because of the use of fraud, force, or coercion to recruit these victims. I think in North Carolina, uh, it's the eighth state, and in the United States, we're the third destination for human trafficking. So these, these people are coming from other countries, and they're being shipped here, and they're being treated as slaves. So... Um, one of the things I think that's, that's important is that this can occur anywhere. It, it occurs in, in homes, it occurs in the fields, it occurs in, um, in, in prostitution. We see it mostly in, in prostitution or sex, sex trade. Uh, we see it in, in <coughs> massage parlors, we see it in a number of different things. And your police department has worked to try to keep it out of this city, but it's, it's been a real challenge. It's been a challenge because basically um, people, people, um, people use other people for their own advantage. And the exploitation part of it is, is really the serious issue that we talk about. You know, the average age of prostitution is about 13 years old. And that's really the issue that we deal with. When we talk about these kids that are recruited, most of those kids are recruited from foster homes. They, they have either mental issues or there's some kind of, uh, of mental challenge that they have. They're recruited and, and placed into prostitution at a very, very young age. And then they're exploited. And these people that... Uh, that traffic in these humans, basically keep them isolated from everyone else. Um, and just like a domestic violence patient, a person, they, they treat them, they control their entire lives. And the same kinds of things that we run up against with domestic violence, we run up against human trafficking. And that's why a lot of places like the Onslow Women's Center, um, the National, or the uh, 
some of the other organizations that are deeply involved in domestic violence are, are involved in human trafficking because it is very similar, that control issue. Uh, I know the mayor has probably heard about the control circle, how that happens in domestic violence. The same kinds of things happen when we talk about domestic violence in these young people. And that's, that's, really, that's really a challenge for us. Because when we go to a hotel, uh, the first thing that happens after we, we, we try to, to find out is that person is moved somewhere else. Between us in Fayetteville, between us in, in Goldsboro, between us in Durham, between us in Mill Willing, uh, Wilmington, people are transported on a very regular basis. And I think, I think the most important part is that these per people are vulnerable. They're young, they have low income, they may be female, they may be abused, they may be refugees. They need work, or they need work from abroad. So they're brought to this country with this idea that they can work abroad, and uh, just like a case that I heard in one of the fields where they bring, him to, uh, bring the person to a field and they won't let him off the truck until he agrees to pay them a certain amount. And until, that, until that's met, the person has to work it off. And what happens a lot of times is that that amount of money becomes astronomical and the person works basically for nothing. So there, there are a number of things and I think it's all about ex exploitation. Exploitation of our fellow human beings. That's what really human trafficking is all about. <clears throat> we can talk about the types of traffickers, we can talk about the people that we prosecuted, but I, I think the most, imp we can talk about gangs because gangs are heavily involved in, in that. There's been 200 ca federal cases involving uh, gangs across our country that have to do with uh, human trafficking. Sex offenders, sex offenders will generally manipulate people. They will exploit people's, people's uh, <clears throat> foster care, 50 to 95 percent of all sex trafficking victims are already have been in foster care. Remember how young I was talking about the average age is about 13 years old? That's, that's uh, when, I, when I was, when we were learning about uh, human trafficking in our in-service training, I was amazed at that fact that, that they were 13 years old. <clears throat> it's high profit and, and low risk. For example, when, we sell, when somebody sells drugs, when we get somebody for selling drugs, that drug is used. When somebody sells a human being, that is sold over and over and over again. They estimate worldwide a $150 billion industry. And it's, and it's an industry that goes below our radars because, especially in this country, we think that people can just walk away. But like domestic violence, like, uh, like other crimes like that, it's very difficult because the, the person that's exploiting these, these children is basically, um, is basically controlling their lives. What are some of the strategies that we've been working on? We've been uh, talking with the city attorney about an escort ordinance so that we can uh, permit escort services to help us get better control of, of who's doing those things in our community. We've been collaborating with PMO and NCIS. It's no secret that a military community is attractive to human traffickers because of a large male population. Community awareness. I think that's an important part of learning about domestic violence, or excuse me, learning about human trafficking and, and trying to see it, because a lot of times people will see certain telltale signs, and if they notify us, and if we can use some of the resources that we have, perhaps we can break that cycle. And then the possibility of developing a human trafficking task force. In North Carolina, we've been exploring that possibility because of the highly mobile nature of, of the, the business. People will be here for a couple days, and then they'll go to some other city, and they'll make a circuit. 
which makes it very difficult for local police to, uh, to investigate and to stop it. So that was my short presentation on, on human trafficking. I'll be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you, Chief. of a holiday. On uh, 02 May 16, I prepared this email to the council. I'd like to read it for the public. Mayor and council, as requested by council member Bittner, HR, meaning human resources and finance, have prepared the following and attached information regarding the proposal to add one additional holiday for city employees. Holidays. The attachment shows the specific holidays of the city, the federal government, and the county government. In summary, what that shows is currently the city has 11 holidays, the federal government 10, the county 15. Eight of those holidays are, are observed by all three governments. Potential cost, personnel policy. The cost is a theoretic number. The city policy states that when an employee works on a holiday, they receive their normal pay. Additionally, they receive a floating holiday that they may take any time during the same fiscal year based upon approval of their supervisor or they may roll it over to sick leave. However, if they have not taken the floating holiday nor rolled it over to sick leave, then the city pays them at the end of the fiscal year, which for the city is June the 30th. If all employees who receive a floating holiday actually were paid out at the end of the fiscal year, the cost for each of the floating holidays would be total $39,700. Police, $21,000. Fire, $17,200. Water and sewer, $1,500 for a total of $39,700. And again, that's a theoretic number for each of our holidays. So if you look at the fact that we have 11 current holidays, you have a theoretic exposure of roughly $420,000. And adding another holiday is $39,700. That's the theoretic number. As I stated in the uh, memo to you in May, in reality, the water and sewer personnel are paid for their holiday because of staffing issues. So when you deal with water and sewer, because uh, in the past year we have been very short on some of our operators, those folks are really, they don't have time to take off. We can't let them take off because that plant has to be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So realistically, we do pay the water and sewer folks for a holiday. When it comes to the police and fire, the numbers actually vary. What really is the hardest holiday for us to uh, have the floating holiday taken are the holidays at the end of the fiscal year. So for example, the beginning of the fiscal year is going to be July 1. July 4th comes up right away. My Clemson mass says like three days away. Okay, It's easy for us to work out that floating holiday because we have basically the whole year to work it out. Same thing with Labor Day. Same thing with Thanksgiving. Same thing with Christmas. The further into the year you get, the more difficult it is to work in. Because remember, it's not just one person who's on the police shift. It's not just one person who's on the fire shift. So I will say to you, realistically, a floating holiday earlier in the year is easier for the city to absorb. Now, there is no mandate that the employee take the floating holiday. What the mandate says is they may take it based upon approval of the supervisor, but if they choose not to take it, then the city must pay them for that floating holiday unless they choose to roll it over to sick leave. So, Every floating holiday has a theoretic number, but every floating holiday also has a realistic number. And realistically, at the end of each fiscal year, 
we pay somewhere in the vicinity of twenty to thirty-five thousand dollars a year for all of the holidays. Now, you know when you when you look at the issues before you, uh, I understand human trafficking. I'm not in favor of it. I think it's a terrible, despicable thing. You know whether you call it slavery or human trafficking, it's all despicable. I think the issue that you as a council have to wrestle with is the issue of what is the impact financially, what's the impact pro productively. We know that every organization, and we cover the city government, provides more services than any government throughout the nation. The city government is where you get your sanitation picked up, your recycling, your roads paved, your recreation activities, all the police and fire, all the code enforcement, all of those things are what we provide as an organization. And the dilemma that you have is not just a, a fiscal responsibility, it's a productivity responsibility and it's a social responsibility. And I recognize that the discussion that you have here tonight is a difficult discussion because you have to weigh all three of those components. <laughs> You know, how many days can we miss commercial garbage? How many days can we pay extra money? And then socially, what is it that you should do? Uh, I will say to you, it's not an easy decision. I don't envy the fact that either tonight or at a future meeting you have to make this decision. I think there are a lot of points on all sides. At the end of the day, physical responsibility and productivity responsibility have to be balanced with social responsibility. And unfortunately for y'all, that's why you get elected. You get paid the big bucks. I mean that in a joking fashion. But you get elected to make these tough decisions. And I don't envy the fact that you're asked to make this decision tonight. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have on this. Can we see the video. <clears throat> For the benefit of the audience and the viewers. Do that make sure I understand the, the clarification, the, the comment is for us to look at the current schedule of holidays and to adopt this as one of those holidays and, and delete one of the other holidays. So, for example, do we have 10 or 11? I sent out the report, but I can't remember. I the think it said 10. I think we 10. have 11. Okay. 11 is federal government has 10. Okay. So what, you're, what you and Mr. Wardner are suggesting is that we add this to the list of holidays and delete one of the other holidays, and you're asking me to look at those and bring you back recommendations. Recommendations. Be happy to do that. I looked at all the holidays that we have. I don't think it's a good idea for us to uh, eliminate days that the federal government has as national holidays. For example, certainly we're not going to eliminate July the 4th. When I looked at the schedule, what I looked at was which day is, in my opinion, the one that is not a day that is tied to other days. I come from the private sector. I will tell you, the private sector has five holidays. They don't have eight, they don't have 10, they don't have 11. The private sector usually has five holidays. When I looked at this, I said, okay, Thanksgiving, okay, we're definitely not going to eliminate that, but we allow the employee to have the day after Thanksgiving off. Why did I not recommend that? It was because many people, Thanksgiving is a family day. It's the day you go somewhere you know, forget that it's the Florida FSU game. Forget that it's the Clemson-South Carolina game. I'm not sure what football games are played in North Carolina around that time. I suppose NC State and North Carolina may find the time to play. But it's a family day. And I said, that's not one I'm willing to touch from an employee standpoint. The next one we looked at 
was, or I looked at, was Christmas. We give either the day before or the day after for travel because, once again, it's a family day. Now, New Year's Day, we give. We don't give anything before or after. Martin Luther King Day, national holiday. The one that I selected was Easter, and I'm going to tell you why. I will tell you straight up and on the record, I'm a Christian. I try to live a Christian life. I know what Good Friday is, but I also know that's not the day I celebrate. I celebrate Sunday. Good Friday may be the death, but it's Sunday that gives me salvation. When I looked at all the holidays of the city, what I recommended to you as council was eliminate Good Friday. Not because I'm anti-Christian, but I'll also give you another thought. One of these days, I'm going to be faced with a Jewish employee, a Muslim employee, some other religious employee, who's going to say, wait a second, why do the Christians get Good Friday off and I don't get this religious holiday for me? I strongly believe in the separation of church and state. I strongly believe in the separation of church and state for many reasons. I still stand behind the recommendation that I gave because I will tell you again, it is not Good Friday, it is Sunday that makes me a Christian. I will also say to you, we will face the day when an employee of a different religion will come forward and demand that right, and when we don't give them to him, we will be taken to court, and the court will then tell us what to do. I don't like to manage through the court system. While I totally support my handsome city attorney, he doesn't like to manage through the court system either, and I'm not gonna ask him to speak on it. But I want the public to know and I want to remind you what my recommendation was, and I want to explain to you why my recommendation was. I still believe that in order to balance fiscal responsibility, productivity, and honor the 13th Amendment, and protect the city from the future, my recommendation to you tonight is the following. Don't add another holiday. Replace the holiday because the 13th Amendment is about a holiday that has to do with the government. Now, I'm sure that I'm going to be booed out of the next church I walk into. I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of people who are going to say that I was wrong. It won't be the first time. I've been married 46 years. And my wife has told me more than once that I was wrong. But my recommendation to you tonight is this. Eliminate Good Friday, replace it with the 13th Amendment. And I stand by that recommendation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Woodruff, for your, for your candor. Um, before I close, it's just one thing. There was the celebration of Juneteenth this past Saturday, and um, I'd like for Miss Cynthia Watson and Angela Cates to stand. Thank you for all that you do uh, year after year. You do the very best you can. Enjoy the parade. The dog has been taken care of. <laughs> You'll know what that means. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Thank you for the police department for getting on that so quickly and, and thoroughly. So could we have a round of applause for us? Very good presentation. Um, before I put this out here and entertain a motion, I want you to remember one, one thing. We have a missing member tonight. Okay? Just a thought. You know, it would be a nice idea to hold council 
weighed in on the decision here. But, you know, I'm going to honor your desire here. And I agree with you, um, Mr. Mayor. The only uh, reluctance that I have is that I was the first one to cancel the last meeting that we had because Mr. Lazar could not be here. And we were blessed to have the, the, the company, the audience that we have tonight, and I kind of think we owe them a decision. So I'd like, I'd like to make a motion that we follow the recommendation of the city manager and replace um, the Friday um, with the 13th Amendment holiday. Any further discussion? I'd like to add something. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, the biggest employer, employer in this city is the um, Camp Lejeune Marine Corps base. Good Friday is not a government holiday anywhere in the land, and the biggest employer in this um, county does not have a holiday for Good Friday. Right. Any other discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, I'll uh, see. I'm going to have to see hands now. All those that voted aye. Okay. All right, motion passes three to two. Thank you. That we are the first. Session of public comment to do. Does anyone want to speak at this time? Way back in the back, back there. Mr. Jim Rod. Now, just for the record, he did not drive his Corvette here tonight. He's, he's got drove, a shirt. He's, a he's got truck. his shirt on that. <laughs> oh, Kawana <Kiwanis>, shirt. Okay. <laughs> to Maplehurst Drive in uh, Jacksonville. I live out in the county. And I didn't come prepared to speak, so I'm probably going to make a big mess in three minutes or less, which I can, which I can do. <laughs> um, I came here to listen, and I did. I listened to every word that was spoken by everyone, and, and I know most of you. I've, I've known most of you for many of the 40 years that I've lived in Onslow County. And there's... And the things that we discussed tonight, I heard a lot of good words. Um, I had a lot of words about the Constitution and about money and about what we can afford to do and, and why we can afford to do it. Um, I have a financial advisor in my home, and it's my wife. And she says, anytime there's something that you really want, you can always afford to do it. You can find the money to do it. So money is not an object. We spoke about uh, getting beyond black and white um, and the other races, and I agree, because what we do tonight is not going to end the impasse that we have in the community and in the country uh, as far as black and white, um, but this is one of the issues that can help us to move from where we came to get where we want to be. I'm really proud to be a, a, a member of this um, community, um, I think we have some very good folks in this community, and I think we've got a good chamber here. You all have made some very good decisions. You made some tough decisions, and I'm, I'm glad this is one you have to make because I don't make the big bucks either. You guys do. But the decision that you make has a big impact on where we get from where we are now. My mother taught me a couple of things. She taught me a lot of things, but one of the things that she taught me was whenever you approach someone, um, have your hand out and handshake, or and uh, have a smile on your face. That did two things. That let them know you're not there to beat their brains out, um, and that you're you you there. You don't come bearing arms. You're there as a friend. When I joined my church, one of the first questions I was asked is, "How do you eat an elephant?" And the I, I, the answer I learned was one bite at a time. 
Um, you might not live long enough to eat that whole elephant, but you're gonna get, you're gonna get a lot of it down. You're certainly gonna get well fed. Um, the decision that you all make t tonight will help us to get way beyond just eating a little bit of that elephant. We're gonna get a lot of it taken because the other thing that my mother taught me was the big important word, and I didn't hear that uh, tonight, but it was implied, and that word is trust. Um, everyone uh, has, a, has a, an impact on what, what decisions that we all make, uh, and they all mean a lot to all of us, regardless of uh, wh wh which ones they are. The important thing to you as a counselor is when you approach each other, you approach each other with your hand out and a smile because you know that you can count on each other to make the right decision. Uh, the right decision, that being for this city that you all represent um, and this county in which we live. I appreciate the service that you all do for this, for, this, for this community. And as God is my witness, and he is, there will come a day when each and every one of us, and not only in Jacksonville or Onslow County or North Carolina, but in the world, uh, we'll just take this country instead of the world. But there will come a day when each and every one of us, as God is my witness, will have to trust on what is done and what is said by each and every one of us. The impact that it has on us as, as a people and us as a community. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Carmen Spicer. And my address is 66 Kerr Street, Jacksonville. I'd like to say good evening, councilwoman and councilmen. I am very happy and impressed of the information that was given tonight. I thought it was very much in detail. I thought it was very much enlightening. I'm sure you all too. The word says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. So tonight, a lot of knowledge was given to you, given to me, that was not known. And I, I, I thank you, but I have a little disappointment, if I may say. With as much knowledge was given tonight, I am surprised, and I know each one of you, I'm shocked that you all did not agree upon the 13th Amendment. A lot of knowledge, a lot of time was spent. Where is the empathy for our race? Where is the empathy? Where is the empathy, my friends? When you come around when it's time for election, where is the empathy? You got to revisit. You got to look at yourself. The Bible said you got to examine yourself. You've got to examine yourself. They're not asking for a whole lot. Money will come because we're, we don't control it anyway. You can, re, you can rework some things. You know, some of you might want to give up part of your salary for that one particular day because some of you make good salary, so it's something to think about. I know I'm, I'm going way out there because that's how I feel at this point. So thank you very much, Councilwoman Washington. Councilman Willingham, you did a superb job. I'm still very disappointed that your colleagues did not agree upon it. All of them. Thank you. God bless you. My name is uh, Pastor Mike, as most people know, Claiborne 324 Rock Creek Drive. I, uh, I too came. I, I celebrate what was offered. Um, however, I don't agree if Good Friday is not a good day. I sat there and I thought about it and I said, you know, adding another one would not have been, been much different to add a holiday to what we already have. Reason being is that as a pastor, um, I grew up in a town where Jewish got their holiday. I grew up in a town where Muslims got their holiday. And to take away from what we do, most of my, my, my parishioners come to me and they want to be able to take off on Good Friday. And a lot of them don't get Good Friday off. Even though Good Friday is presented there, most people still work on Good Friday. So they don't get Good Friday even though it is there. I, however, I do think that we could have added one. Because again, money, 
we understand people take more days than you than you, than we know of. They take days for all kinds of days. Sometimes they're not even sick. They're fishing, so we do know that. They're not, they, you know. I, I'm a pastor, and I catch them on Facebook and say, I thought you were sick today on Sunday, and they take a holiday. So we do understand that. But I appreciate uh, what was presented. I do appreciate everybody's opinion. However, I do agree that everyone won't agree. So I respect um, those at this point um, who did not agree because we do not, we live in a, place where everybody don't agree with everything. But I appreciate th those that did say yes, that we do get the holiday, but I do think that it could have been added on to what we already have so that we can continue to, can continue to get those holidays that we already have and add it on. Because we don't want to be the only city that says we're the only place that don't have Good Friday when everyone else has it. So we don't want to be just that because that would sound like, okay, well, you all got rid of Good Friday? Why not made it an extra? And as far as the numbers and the money, many people have made their own statement. We don't understand the money. But I do think that we could have added a holiday and still gotten the same results uh, in the city that we have right now. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Dan Witten, 207 Patrick Allen Lane. First of all, Dr. Woodruff, thank you on so many levels of leadership tonight. I want to personally thank you, and uh, on those that I help represent and that I work with every day, I want to thank you for your leadership tonight. Um, uh, I turned 30 years old in December. I still am, I guess, young. Uh, but I don't feel like I'm young, but uh, the youth look up to those who are in leadership to, be, to model that behavior of leadership. And uh, as someone who is in that age range, thank you. Uh, as most of you guys know, I was able to attend the candlelight vigil um, here at the Freedom Fountain for the uh, Orlando uh, victims. And I want to say thank you to the uh, town leadership and the administration for it, responding so responsibly to the request from Ms. Catherine Howell, I believe, who organized that, uh, to change the colors of the fountain to the rainbow colors. Uh, you know, being born and raised in Jacksonville, uh, I know that there is a deep stigma, uh, but I think that that was also a small step forward and a responsible progress uh, in this community because there is a huge LGBT community in Jacksonville, even who serve in the military uh, and who are veterans. And uh, we might not all agree on or understand that whole entire concept, but uh, I'm proud of my town leadership for stepping up to that plate and, uh, and again, being leaders. Um, it's not easy to make decisions. You have to you know, balance you know, being fiscally responsible and socially responsible at the same time. So again, thank you so much. And uh, uh, I look forward to these small steps of progress. Anything that I can do to help out. You, like, you guys let me know. Find me at Walmart, wherever, drag me to wherever, and I will do <coughs> what I can to help out. I uh, thank you so much again. Good evening, my name is Angela Cates, and my address is 415 University um, Drive in Jacksonville. I want to thank Councilman Willingham and Councilwoman Washington, as well as Mr. Woodruff, you all for your wonderful presentation. You all, um, and Mr. Woodruff, for your empathy and the way that you expressed you know, the holiday situation. Um, I do understand that everybody is not going to agree, but, this is a step forward for the city of Jacksonville. And for that, I really do appreciate your vote. So thank you. My name is Alex McMillan. I'm the assistant pastor at Philadelphia Olden Church. I live in Georgetown community. And I just want to say today to the city councilman, I'm very happy what happened here today, but I'm kind of like the minister said, we always can add to, but we should never take away. And I think the knowledge that we learned here tonight is for our education, our growth for our children, because we never want to live in the past again, but we want to go forward, but we don't ever want to forget where we come from. So I say to the council today, 
the presentation and those that voted for it. It was good. Like the minister said, I don't think we should have took away from the uh, the vacation day, but we should have just added another to it. But that's my comment, and I just want to say thank you for all that you've done for the city of Jacksonville. Uh, hopefully that will continue to grow with love and unity throughout our community. Thank you. I've heard it like three times about the um, uh, Good Friday being not being a holiday no more. I think it's important that everybody understands that it's still a holiday. It's just not a paid holiday. I'm a union official. I'm, I'm actually local president for AFG Local 2065. I represent about 6,000 employees here in the 3rd Congressional District. And on a national level, I'm the uh, council president for the Marine Corps. I represent about 14,000 employees. We don't have Good Friday as a holiday, as a federal holiday. I just want to put it out there, just point of information. Thanks. Thank you. All right, before we get going, I need to get a point of clarification on that uh, last motion. Now, that did, that was to accept the Resolution is written on that date, right? I was yes. Sure. Okay. The second Monday okay. in December. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we move on. Uh, we're going to reports. I'll start with you, Mr. Willingham. I'd just like to thank um, my counsel. Um, I think history will smile upon the decision that you've made tonight. Nothing further. Mr. Bittner. No report this evening. Mr. Warden. No report. Mr. Thomas. Well, it's been so long since we've been here, I feel like I have to say something, that uh, we've had a couple of important events, I guess, with the opening of the splash pad. It was very successful, and it's been getting a lot of use. Uh, the opening of the Georgetown exercise lapping that we went uh, last Saturday. So even though it's, uh, we haven't had many meetings, there's been a lot being going on. And I want to thank the staff and folks that made that happen. Thank you. Pleasure. Ms. Washington. Um, I would just like to say um, to the citizens of Jacksonville, thank you for coming out and supporting us this evening. To my fellow councilmen, um, I thank you for your support. Um, history was made tonight, and um, as the youngest person on the council, um, there's many of you in the audience that fought for my freedom to be your representative, and for that I am very thankful. Um, some of you knew my parents, some of you knew my brothers, um, some of you didn't even know I existed because they knew I had older brothers, but for some reason they thought I was adopted into my family. <laughs> um, I am just so proud to be a local elected official for Jacksonville and to, to be able to say that I am a part of a history and to represent a city that decided to embrace what the 13th Amendment means to a group of people and to say, even though it is your history tonight, we are going to embrace your history as our history is monumental. And I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, I have to commend you on your presentation tonight. It was very well put together, and you, you presented your case very well. Uh, Dr. Woodruff. Mayor, earlier today I got a telephone call from the media asking when we were going to adopt the city's budget for the coming year. <laughs> and we did that on, so just for the public, I, I know that the county budget has gotten a lot of press the last week. 
Uh, the city government, through the leadership of the mayor and council, they have set a schedule that we adopt our budgets early. Our budget was officially adopted on May the 17th, 2016. There's no tax increase, there are no fee increases, there's no water or sewer increases. So for those of you who came tonight with the anticipation of hearing a long and wonderful presentation from Gail Maids, our finance director, regarding the budget. We're sorry to disappoint you. You're 30 days too late. Okay. Second thing, it's been interesting to look at the splash pad. Uh, it doesn't matter when you go over there, the splash pad is busy. I remind everybody that it's open seven days a week from 10 in the morning until, what, Ron, 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock in the afternoon? I'm not sure. Okay, either 6 or 7. Our, we've been open roughly 30 days, and the unofficial count is that we have served over 5,000 people. Now, they may be the same people, but, uh, I mean, they may be the same people, but there have been over 5,000 individuals who splashed around. Today, I had the pleasure of going over there, and when I was there, there were 33 young people there at quarter to three. There were adults there, and so I took the time to ask the adults, you know, is this your first time? One woman said, ever since it opened, I've been here three days a week. Another woman said, today's my first time. Well, are you going to come back? Absolutely. How long do you usually stay? I had to laugh. One woman said, it depends on how my children are behaving. <laughs> Said the other day I was here for almost two hours. The next day I came, we were here for 30 minutes. So we do have some operational problems that we're going to face with the splash pad. Uh, when you go over there, you will find that uh, some of the concrete, instead of draining back towards the drains, is draining out towards the grass. So there are going to be some additional modifications that we're going to have to make. Uh, it may result in the splash pad, uh, you know, having some fencing around it. We don't anticipate having to cut it off. There aren't any leaks, but uh, when the water doesn't drain right, it creates mud. And I will tell you, mud getting into the drains, get into the filters, which slow down the pumps, which reduce the pressure, which makes it doesn't work. So it is a work in process, in progress, or whichever the right term is. We're working on it to improve it. Two other things we would like to mention. For those of you who like to come by the city hall to pay your water and sewer bill, summer hours have begun. The drive-up window, now not the counter, but the drive-up window is now open at 7.30 in the morning and stays open until 5.30 in the afternoon, five days a week. And those five days are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay? So if, you, if you're going to work and you need to drop off your payment, just pull up to the drive-up window. We now provide the service 30 minutes early, and that will be through the whole summer. This past uh, weekend, we had the North Carolina Symphony in town. And I know many of you were able to attend, but I'm going to tell you the park that you as the mayor and council have given this community, you are to be commended. While the weather was wonderful, the park setting is phenomenal. And I will tell you, you are to be commended for making that park look so beautiful. Lastly, I would like to remind the public that our next city council workshop or meeting will be August the 2nd. There are no council meetings in the month of July. So with August that, third. what did I say, July? August, 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 it's August the 3rd right now, unless you reschedule it. Oh, August the 3rd. Well, yeah. of, uh, whenever we're right meeting, now. it's in August. There'll be no meetings in July, okay? The first so whenever, Wednesday in August. The first Wednesday in August. Okay, and thanks for correcting me. Because of National Night Out being <coughs> on the 2nd. Yes. All right. Flash, With that... Flash uh, at hours are 10 to 7, Monday through Saturday, 1 to 6 on Sundays. 1 to 6 on Sunday. Okay, thanks for checking that. You know, it's amazing when you have those gadgets that Ron knows how to operate. You can find out anything, any time of the day. <laughs> Lastly, I, I want to always commend you as a council for the leadership. Decisions are not easy, but that's what leadership is about. And it doesn't matter whether you voted for or against the decision tonight. 
The leadership continues, and I personally appreciate the fact that after that vote is over, y'all come back together as a united group to face the next issue. And as your manager, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Mr. Carter, no report, Mayor. Thank you. To adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh.